I'm Charlotte Ann Lucas with Nowcast SA, and I'm back again with uh, Dr. Luis Frago, um, who is here, who came in for this event today. Um, and why don't you tell us a little bit about how you got involved and um, why you're here? Well, I um, am here in San Antonio because I'm attending the uh, annual meeting of the Western Political Science Association. And I got an email about a month ago from Francine Romero, the uh, Associate Dean of the School of Public Policy here, inviting me to come. I was very excited to come for a number of different reasons. I've done some research on civic participation. I do research on cities and city government and city government accountability, elections and voting in cities, you know, very much related to the sorts of issues that the city is considering here. Uh, probably the most important reason and I was very happy to be invited is because um, your current mayor, Julian Castro, is a former student of mine <laughs> at Stanford University, and I know how much he has tried to encourage um, citizen participation and the whole San Antonio 2020 project. So given, being given the opportunity to participate was very important. Um, it's rare for a city to take leadership in trying to engage its citizens. It's rare for public officials to try to want to, to actually seriously go out and seek more citizen engagement. So San Antonio is positioned now to be a leader in the nation if it's able to pull this off, if it's able to, in fact, engage more citizens in the process of thinking about city government, but actually taking the risk of giving more citizens an, an opportunity to influence city governments and therefore to hold public officials more accountable that the city and the city government in combination with a major university here in the city has taken on this leadership role is a tremendous opportunity that the city has and I think an opportunity that we'll know in time whether or not it's going to realize. Um, attendance at this particular event is greater than was anticipated. It's about double what was anticipated. That's a wonderful sign of engagement that occurs. You look at the diversity of backgrounds, genders, people in the audience, uh, community organizers, business people, people from the public sector. Uh, that's a wonderful, unique opportunity to get people to talk with one another. Um, but it's not just about talking. It's about taking action as well. Mm -hmm. And my hope is that we'll be able to contribute a little bit in trying to encourage more of that action being taken. Absolutely. It's, it's um, interesting to me, and we, um, uh, we spoke uh, at some length with Ben Warner, who is a, the facilitator of the SA 2020 process, about what it takes to get people who don't agree about everything mm -hmm. to sit across the table and find things they agree um, mm -hmm. with each other about. Mm -hmm. and, and um, we see a lot of examples of exactly the opposite of that in the rest of the country right now. Do you think that there is something, um, is it just the moment in time in San Antonio? Is it where the push is coming from? What's, what's different here? I, um, I think the leadership Mm -hmm. is very different here. Mm -hmm. I think San Antonio understands itself now because of the tremendous uh, population growth, mm -hmm. uh, because of the youth of many of its political leaders, mm -hmm. uh, because of its growing and increasingly diversified economy. I think it sees itself as having a responsibility to do something different. Mm -hmm. um, it doesn't want to be New York. It certainly doesn't want to be, um, you know, among the cities that have great challenges ahead of them, you know, cities like Detroit. Uh, it wants to be a leader in a very special way. And I think many people have decided that one of the ways in which that sort of leadership is realized is when you provide opportunities for people from different backgrounds and with different political interests to be able to get together across from each other across a table and actually engage with one another. It's a very interesting thing that happens when you put people of very different interests and backgrounds, maybe even different expectations. Everybody has the expectation that the city do better. But how it should do better and who it should do better for or where you get a lot of differences of opinion. So one of the interesting things that happens when you put people together of different backgrounds is that they start from a point of discussion about their specific interests. Their, their specific concern, their problem, their issue, um, the fact that they didn't get something they wanted 20 years ago, the fact that yesterday they didn't get something that they wanted. And you have to let people get all of that out, vent all of that. And what happens relatively soon afterwards, may take a couple of meetings, may take three, is that they begin to listen to each other. And they begin to learn from each other. And in that process of talking about their own individual things, they begin to see how much they have in common how much they actually share with each other or how if they actually work together with that other person who has a very different issue, they both might be able to get what it is that they want. So there's a process of developing a common agenda, a process of unification 
so to speak, that does talk, doesn't always occur, but that can occur and often occurs when you give people a chance to talk from the heart and from the head at the same time about a set of interests that they want to pursue in local government. That's what I see as the great opportunity that San Antonio has through this process. And um, what, what kind of differences can it, can it make down the road? Well, it's, it's, it, um, well, what we're looking at today here, which is um, increasing voter participation and linking increasing voter participation to government accountability. Um, public officials um, get their positions um, based upon getting elected. And if a process like this can put together new ideas to increase voter participation, and it's going to lead to public officials thinking about their jobs in a different way. They're going to be more responsive to the public. or They're going to think differently about the issues that they're asked to confront related to the public. So the um, opportunity that focusing on um, voter turnout and voter participation does and civic engagement more broadly defined is that it's going to make the public officials, interestingly enough, not just more responsive, better at their jobs than they would <laughs> normally be because they have more information. And it's not information they're getting just from experts. It's the information they're getting from people who actually live with the consequences of their decisions. And those people will hold them accountable once the decisions are made. And that's a beautiful process. That's how democracy is supposed to work. You don't always win, but you win some of the time, but you always know you have a voice, and you know your voice has a realistic chance of being heard. Well, that's what a process like this gives the city an opportunity to do. Basically, what, what city public officials have done in endorsing this is to give themselves more work. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure they realize that. But, but it's the work they've chosen to do. And the most important point is it's the work we have entrusted them to do, that the voters have, I'm not a mm -hmm. resident of San Antonio, have a work that the voters have entrusted them to do. Mm -hmm. And they need to be held accountable for that. And in fact, they want to be held accountable because if they're held accountable, then they know how they can keep their office. Oh. So there's a wonderful way in which it helps them actually be better representatives because they're representing more people or representing people in a different way or hearing things in a different way than they would before. So there's a possibility of a win for the citizens, mm -hmm. a win for the government officials. When those two folks are on the same side, the city's going to win overall. Let's take it back to the, the beginnings of democracy, mm -hmm. I mean, in, in this country, mm -hmm. in this country, and, and how much, um, I think um, Ben Warner invoked uh, de Tocqueville, mm -hmm. uh, talk about the whole notion mm -hmm. of, of, mm -hmm. of what it takes mm -hmm. to... Mm -hmm. Well, and, you know, democracy is a, relatively speaking, it's a new form of government. It hasn't been around as long as... Um, as um, um, monarchies and authoritarian rule and rule by raw power. So um, when the United States was among the first to experiment with that, not the first, there was, you know, Indian tribes in the Iroquois Nation who had developed tremendous systems of um, consensus building and public decision making in upstate New York and parts of Canada and so forth. And there were African tribes that had similar systems before. But in terms of a, a nation state that was established from European origins, we're among the first, probably the first to actually uh, deal with that. Well. Our initial experience with democratic participation was um, very clear. Um, we limited participation to a relatively small percent of the electorate, right? Our origins are we have slavery. We don't allow women to vote. We don't allow those who don't own land, who don't own property to vote. Mm -hmm. Now, that meant that maybe on the average, depending upon the historian you believe, about 20% of the people who lived in the United States at the time of our founding actually got to participate in some significant way. So we've had to, in a sense, compensate for our origins, which we're doing here today. We're, we, we have continually been, fa and we've expanded over the course of time, right? When, when did women get the vote? Not till 1920. When did uh, many African Americans get the vote? They got it right after the Civil War, only lasted for 10 years, then we took it away again as a country, not just the South, as an entire country supported by the Supreme Court, didn't get it back until 1965. For many Latinos, they really didn't start to participate in substantial numbers until 1975 when the Voting Rights Act was extended to be. So those are recent periods of time. So we have always struggled and, and have made gradual progress, but we've always struggled with making as much progress as we actually could and being as inclusive as we actually could. I'll give you a few very significant mm -hmm. examples. Um, we are 
probably the only democratic nation in the, in the world where the government doesn't have the responsibility for registering us to vote. In most other democratic countries in the world, the government takes the responsibility for registering us to vote because we are the government. The citizens are the government. And the government says we have to give the citizens that right. We have to facilitate it in every way that we can. We, chose a, we choose a different model. We have an opt-in model. You choose to participate if you want. We've got some great arguments as to why that's better. People are more informed. People are more motivated. But the counter argument to that is, and a lot of people don't participate. You want to increase participation? It's very simple. You pursue a system like in Belgium or like in Australia. You have mandatory voting. You pay a fine of $25, $50 if you don't vote. Guess what? Voter participation rates in those countries, democratic countries, voter participation rates are upwards of 95%. Consistently. Simple rule change. Right? You're going to pay, let's make it $20. A $20 fine if you don't vote. Guess what? The government's not going to charge you that fine until it registers you to vote. Right? And so the, the government is playing along with, appropriately, right, trying to enhance participation. We're also one of the few countries in the world where elections are not a national holiday. In most countries in the world, when you actually, and the government does this, and the government makes a law, it's because the government says, we have a responsibility for letting all of our citizens vote and for paying them for that day. And our employers have a responsibility. Our employers benefit from that. Our workers our citizens as well. They should have the right to participate. And it's a national holiday. It's a day to celebrate citizen influence over public officials. Kind of makes sense in a democratic <laughs> society. We do it very differently. We have national elections one year. We have congressional elections another year. We have municipal elections at different periods of the, of the year than either state elections or county elections. We can, you know, we handle it differently. There are historical reasons for that, a history of states, states wanting to control it, doing it in different ways. What we certainly don't have is a system that facilitates that participation. We struggle with that still. That's why we're here in trying to think about that. Our whole history of electing city council candidates, San Antonio is a wonderful example of this, you know, at large versus single member districts. Does one encourage more participation or another? Um, who's advantaged and disadvantaged by that? There are all these election rules that can happen. Bottom line is we have to compensate for some of the deficiencies that we have systematically. One of the ways in which we try to do that is by encouraging more people to take responsibility for registering and voting, but also for trying to encourage their neighbors to participate mm -hmm. in the Alexis de Tocqueville was amazed when he came here in 1836, a French aristocrat, with how much citizen participation there was. That's because his reference point was France, where there was none. So, and he was absolutely right. We had incredible citizen participation. That's varied over the course of time, and we still struggle. You know, the, the recent figures that we heard this morning, that 11% of eligible San Antonio residents and citizens voted in the last city council election is unconscionable. Mm -hmm. How can 11% of adults determine the future of the city in terms of the election of leaders? The city has taken that on as a challenge and wants to try to do something about it. Can you give me some national context for that? Um, participation in local government elections is the lowest all across the country. Mm -hmm. It's lower in cities that have nonpartisan elections, like San Antonio does. There are historical reasons for why we have nonpartisan mm -hmm. elections. There are good arguments for and against it. What nobody disputes is that if you have nonpartisan elections, fewer people turn out and vote. Mm -hmm. There are reasons for that. You tend to have less competitive elections in nonpartisan elections because you don't have Democrats competing with Republicans. You also um, don't have the primary battles that occur where you have the Democrats competing with other Democrats and the Republicans competing with other Republicans. You have less money invested in campaigns because you don't have party organizations involved. Does it make the campaigns cleaner? Depends. Uh, cleaner in terms of there not being you know, some shenanigans going on in the elections. Um, if you have at-large elections, like San Antonio had for a large part of its history, particularly uh, in the, from the mid-1950s to the 1970s, mm -hmm. that depresses voter turnout. Mm -hmm. um, if you have fewer candidates running for office, that depresses voter turnout. So we know some things that we can try to change or think about how to work around to try to increase voter turnout. So 
local elections, it's it's down in this community for some some significant reasons. Um, national elections, um, we saw a midterm election where where the numbers were down again. Yeah. Um, yeah. And yeah. I think they were down more yeah. than they were yeah. down yeah. in the last midterm. Yeah. So I mean, we're, we're also dealing with the have, national. We have a systemic problem. Mm -hmm. I mean, our mm -hmm. our highest participation rates of eligible American citizens. This is a people who are citizens of the United States, who are above the age of 18, who um, are not uh, currently um, convicted of a felony and serving a prison sentence. So the folks who are eligible um, in presidential elections among our highest turnout rates are at 60%. This is across the country. Uh, people say that's great, 60%. We're, um, we're, I think, second to the bottom of national participation in national elections among all democratic countries in the world. Wow. Now, now magnify that by the 11% in San Antonio who turn out in city elections, you say we have a systemic problem. So mm -hmm. although participation in local elections is lower than in congressional elections, off-year congressional elections and presidential elections, all of our participation as a nation is low. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. When's the last time we talked about the government registering everyone to vote? We've never done it. When's the last time in a presidential campaign, part of the campaign issue was, if you elect me to be president of the United States, I'm going to work to change the rules to let more of you decide whether or not I should keep this office. <laughs> we haven't heard that in a long time. Or a presidential candidate who says, we should have a national holiday after I get elected. We should have a national holiday so I can benefit from being the incumbent. We should have a national holiday to encourage more. Or a president who's going out of office who says, you know, I did my best, I served, I tried to serve as many people as I could, but I was only elected in an election where 60 percent of the American public participated. That's wrong. I can't run for office again, but I'm going to work in, the, in my last term to make sure that more Americans, American citizens, can participate, who have the right to participate. We don't have those conversations. We get comfortable with the low rates of participation that we have. All cities struggle with this. The only exceptions are when you have a very controversial election, a very contested election, when turnout rates go up. But they never go upwards beyond. On the average, don't go up anywhere near our national presidential participation rates. And our accountability suffers as a result of that. So that's part of what makes you excited about what's going on here? Oh, I think so. It has There's a real opportunity. I mean, no, there are mm -hmm. struggles. Um, mm -hmm. The city can change its election day on its own. It's got to get permission from the state, I think. I'm not up on all of my Texas law, but it's probably going to be a negotiation. Um, mm -hmm. Elections are expensive. Mm -hmm. They cost money. Um, that might be an incentive for people, for the city, to think of coordinating its elections with county and state elections so that you can share the costs in a better way. city has to pay for it on its own when it holds it on a separate day. It costs mm -hmm. a good bit of money uh, to hold an election. Um, the city will have to mobilize its state delegation in Austin to see if they can get support for doing this. Some people will say yes, some people will say no, but if, if a coalition, a diverse coalition of interests, business leaders, neighborhood leaders, community leaders, um, civic leaders get together from San Antonio and say, we want to do it differently. We want to give more voice to people who pay taxes. I think, and, and, and the San Antonio delegation in Austin, right, Democrats and Republicans, go there and say, we support our city in doing this. I think there's a chance that maybe some progress can be made. Wow. You're giving me the feeling that I just got um, uh, some of your um, wonderful um, college lectures uh, for <laughs> <laughs> gratis here, and I appreciate it. Sure. Um, but but speaking of, of college lectures, so um, it sounds like you're suggesting that you're 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 okay with um, how your uh, former students <laughs> doing. Yes, uh, both of my former students, both Joaquin <laughs> and Juliana. I'm um, for a political science professor. It's um, a dream come true to have um, any of his or her students think of running for public office. Um, because it means that, that maybe they were listening in class. <laughs> um, but more importantly, it means that um, nothing you said in class depressed them so much that they decided that this wasn't worth it at all. Or, you know, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to make money. I'm not going to you know, go out and, and serve the public. So it, it suggests that maybe as a professor, you make a small contribution to their thinking about serving the larger public and making a contribution to the larger community that they're part of. 
when they do it with as much care, um, thought, analysis, sophistication, and innovation as, um, as um, your mayor does and as one of your state representatives does, um, it's hard not to feel very humbled by the incredible um, opportunity that they represent for the future of this community, you know, of the state, and certainly, um, certainly of the country. Thank you so much. Sure. I, I really appreciate you taking the time sure. Very um, happy to, to talk to us, and I'm, I'm glad you're visiting San Antonio. Sure.